Recording has begun. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great that you're all get, that you're all joining today, um, and welcome back, Dawn, uh, from weeks of travel. We're glad to have you back and to hear how um, all the conferences went, um, and just to have your input back into uh, this working group. Um, we don't have uh, many agenda items for today. We do have two um, updates. One is that Sophia, myself, and Elizabeth, we all met to think through what the event location inclusivity project would look like. Um, and so I think we'll continue to meet um, to think through what those plans would be and then bring it back to this group. Um, then the other thing from our last meeting is that we talked about a paper that Matt had brought to the group about um, a takeoff metric. Um, that paper was written a, a while ago, and so I think a lot of us um, had thoughts on what that would look like. And so I wanted to make sure we, we brought that back up for anyone who still wanted to discuss that and um, had thoughts on if, if that could be a potential project uh, for this group. I have to admit, I haven't read the paper. I have not read the paper either. <laughs> That's okay. And I think all, none of us have. <laughs> I think we all have <laughs> it when Matt brought it up on the screen. I have do you have it in my paper? queue. Yeah. I think it's in the channel. Yeah, let me but... just go back to the last notes to see if I can. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty I'm high up in the it. channel. I can. I can... I can drop it in the, the thing. Thanks, Don. Yeah. Oops, that's the Slack thing. So I think for that one, we can um, we can keep it as a um, back burner topic for now, and um, and we'll we'll keep it on this um, on this agenda just so that we can. If, if anyone has, does take a look at it and wants to uh, potentially create a project based on it or think through what, what a response to it would look like uh, for chaos, uh, we'll, we'll keep it on the agenda for that and um, make sure that it, it might make sure that it is a, a topic that people are um, interested in. And if it's not, that's okay too. We can take, always take it off. Um, but uh, today I actually had a hot topic to bring up and the question that we posted in the chat was, what are the top metrics you look at after a license change? Um, I kind of thought of this because last night I was going through um, Redis since they've recently had a license change um, to become a dual license. And uh, one of the things I noticed on GitHub was that you can't look at the number of forks that occurred within a certain time period. Um, right now, they only show um, who forked it and when they forked it, but there is an account for that. Um, so uh, some discussion started in uh, the Slack channel. And I just wanted to open up to the rest of the group to just have an interesting discussion about this. But you, you, you can't can look at see them? forks and records. Sorry, I interrupted you, Sean. I should raise my no, hand. No, I was, I should too. You go ahead. I was going to say, I have looked at historical fork counts, um, but also because we have a historical record uh, from the archive. And so I haven't really been relying on the GitHub API for forks. So I, I'm curious, like, can you explain the limitation? You're only able to look at forks, like fork events versus like historically how many forks? Yep, doesn't... Exactly, you can only look at yeah. the events. Yeah, so what I've done there is used archive and just counted them all. So just look yep. at the number of counts and then accumulated them over time. Um, but that's somewhat, I think that's, that's public, but it requires access to it. So you can access it, but that's not necessarily a great source either because it doesn't count everything. So I'm curious how others have, have addressed that. John. I'm I'm looking at how we've addressed it um, in Augur. 
It certainly it obviously shows up on the web page, but you're saying you don't see it in the API. The API has has a fork count, but it doesn't give you historical information. So you know what the fork count is today, but you can't uh, get out I of the see. API what was the fork count two months ago or three months or ago. Or like who forked it and how yeah. many forks happened in a certain period. Yeah, because it's, it's in the event API, which is, I forget how many days of historical record. Mm. It's a, just a certain about, number. Of, yeah, no more than 90 days, yeah. basically. So for looking at trends, the longer a project has been in an auger instance, the more snapshots of the fork count that I have. However, that's not publicly available. So I think Sophia's suggestion of looking at Git archive is probably the best way to get historical information. Have you thought about, um, well, this is another topic, I'll put it in the topics. No, go for it. I honestly, I wasn't doing it um, for any reason. I was just curious as to how many people forked the project right after the license changed. <laughs> and so it was just out of pure curiosity. Yeah, I mean, personally, if I was if I was using Redis in in say a product or something, I I might be inclined to fork it right after, right after, so that I would have my own copy of it because I don't want to use what, um, you know, whatever they've relicensed to. So I, I would expect to see a flurry of, of forks. But, you know, what's interesting about, sorry, this is just kind of a tangent, but I have seen, so, so there's like GitHub forks, which is I want to fork this so I have a copy of it so that I can either contribute back or, you know, do something else with it. And then there's like the public forks, like people who want to fork it and maintain it. So like what OpenSearch did with Elasticsearch. And I've seen three or four groups that are trying to fork Redis right now. And so I'll be curious to see where that where that goes. My money's on placeholder KV. Yeah, same. Is that the Amazon <laughs> one? Uh, yeah, it's the yeah. former main core contributor of Redis was like, yeah. nope. <laughs> yeah, my money's, my money's on that one too, <clears throat> for sure. That would be the Gary Tability metric right there. So. Oh no, I I could I, I'm gonna I'm gonna wax lyrical about viability here for a minute because I think that um, there's a lot of implications that you can draw from looking at probably the two weeks or the month after the for the licensing change is announced, and there's some things that you can judge just based on kind of qualitatively. They'll mention things in like a blog post because they did mention that they're going to end support. Uh, in large part for the versions that aren't paid for in the like medium to long term, like it's going to be security patches, but there's not going to be a lot of active maintenance unless you're paying for it. Um, and then they're going to end security patches at some point. So mm -hmm. those numbers are very important to know because it gives an understanding of how long you have to basically delay making a decision to delay when you need to consider if you expect it to take six months to take Redis out of an application, then you need to know when that six months would be up and when you'd have to start paying for it or risk getting hit with a CVE that you now absolutely have to overhaul your application for. And those dates are important. The If it's a foundation that decided to do a license change, I think that, as Sean had mentioned, that tends to have a little bit of a different connotation than if you have a um, company that decides to do a license change because you might have a company that has an ulterior profit motive, or you might have a foundation that has an ulterior profit motive that kind of will give an in indication of whether or not uh, like you could get away with using the open source version for longer, um, or if you need to move sooner. There's the community of, I think we talked about forks for a little while just now, but also how many contributors just stop contributing? because they don't want to contribute to a project that's not going to allow them to use their contribution without paying for it, um, so on and so on. I think that uh, I can make an argument for practically all of the governance and community and strategy and license and compliance that come up in the viability discussion. Uh, if you're interested in measuring some of that, there's the viability starter that I am currently working with uh, Sean and Callie to get a uh, like uh, 
a write up of how that would work and how you might uh, track and implement that uh, that model, because I would really like to see um, how it works internally for Verizon. And I figure if I'm going to use these open source tools, I should I should be uh, contributing back and giving some guides out or something like that. So my, my that's all to say um, viability. I'll have something out. Use that. It's great. I, I think it's great. <laughs> Can I ahead, ask Sophia. you a question about the viability metric? And Absolutely. I feel like this is something I should remember from all the reviews that we did with you. But I guess I've been thinking more about maintenance these days um, mm -hmm. and wondering how well the viability metrics and indicators would be of maintenance burden or like maintainability internally as well. Because I know that's also sort of a factor that you're looking at of just like, how yes. easy is it to get involved with stream or to accept changes that won't break your system? But more that I'm curious how well of a measure or predictor it would be of sort of maintenance effort required to keep this upstream project up to date. Yeah, I really appreciate that you're bringing that up because it is not covered very well by basically any pillar right now that I have publicly published. Um, but we have an internal publication of a magical fifth pillar of viability that we're using that has to do with version specific pieces where a lot of the chaos metrics are not version specific. And so I want to find a way to contribute that back up. Um, but I'm, I'm currently doing so much uh, just to get the thing running that I, I haven't considered publishing it. But I, I can give you an indication of like what I think it's going to look like is um, it's, it's basically how obsolete is the version that you're using. So is it something that uh, they publish every two months and you haven't updated it in 15 years? Or is it something that publishes every two days and you haven't updated it in two months? Like those two should have radically different understandings of maintenance burden. Uh, and there's like a couple of things that I've thought pretty hard about on how we can do that effectively. But again, given that it's like, I want to have more discussions and maybe we can have this discussion at some point in this meeting of like almost all of the tools for chaos are designed to not be version um, specific. And so should there be just like a tool that tracks the version specifics so that you can have this nice correlation of obsolescence? Um, something I've thought about, yeah. But yeah, sorry, I know I'm, I'm derailing us. <laughs> Go ahead, I'll raise my hand. Oh, I was just going to say, oh, was it Sean? I don't know. I have a lot of feelings on this day because I'm looking at something similar internally right now. And I am struggling with the version component as well, uh, mostly because of something that Sean and I talked about a while ago in the risk working group um, of just like the ability to assess breaking changes. Um, and so you can see the number of releases, but often most projects, you can't even see the major releases from the minor releases, at least in the GitHub event stream, um, where I was actually talking to Bob Killen and the Kubernetes project around how they use milestones um, around how they release major versions of things where that might be like, if you're looking at sort of version and freshness, um, understanding minor releases versus major releases can be a qualitative assessment that would yes. like assess how, like it's one of those things where like, I haven't seen a reliable indicator across all projects to be able to do that. Um, and so at least that's something I'm struggling with, but I realize that that is really diverging from the topic and maybe we should create this as a separate topic, Gary, um, yeah. or keep going and Don <laughs> has her hand up, so I'll stop talking. Yeah, so my, my hand's up basically for kind of the, uh, also the, the versioning thing. Um, uh, it is it is really interesting to be able to look at versions. So if you look at how DevStats does, um, does their charts, almost all of their charts have release markers. You can see what's happening in the data um, and you can see how it connects to uh, releases. So, so that data is, is really interesting. I mean, I agree, Gary, we haven't really, our, most of our metrics are completely release agnostic and it's an interesting contrast to the way that DevStats does things where they, they have releases and milestones for everything. So you can always, yeah. You can always cut the data by um, by release. But and and I, I don't think that that's like a bad thing to be clear. I'm not like trying to pick on chaos tools that do a lot of measurement of things that these version specific tools don't do. 
like not focusing on versions has given a lot of context that wouldn't be available version by version, or even if we had a data structure that did even account for versions. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I put another topic so that we can contain it um, because I am I, I could go on about this. I've been spending a lot of time on this outside of chaos. So I'm happy to, to bring it more <clears throat> into this group. And going back to Shan's earlier question, which is what are the metrics that you look for after after a license change? Um, I I have to admit that after the license change, uh, the project tends to be just sort of dead to me if they've switched to a non non open source license. <laughs> so I don't I don't know that I typically continue measuring stuff. It's uh, at that point you're as a company. So you know I could say that you know when I was when I was at a company and Elasticsearch we licensed. We were looking at damage control. Um, you know, can we switch to something else? The answer is no, because there was nothing else to switch to. Um, and so we ended up paying for licenses for the the projects that absolutely needed it, which sucked. Um, but but yeah, so so we generally switch pretty quickly to uh, how do we how do we fix this problem as opposed to how do we keep measuring things? Sophia. Sophia. No, I was going to plus one that I think a lot of what we did was damage control as well. So the metrics we're looking at are all internal. So internal dependencies, usage, who's using it, what, they're, what are they doing it for, and what's the disruption of ripping it out or replacing with something else, or to Don's point, do we need to just pay for the license? Um, the other thing that's harder to measure that we were tracking, so to speak, um, because it's the open source effect, for lack of a better term, what are the feelings around it? Um, we were looking at a number of sort of like now that we have I don't know, five or six cases in the last few years of prominent projects changing their licenses. Um, they were all sort of met differently in the community as well as in the industry. And a lot of those differences came down to just how they were handled. <laughs> like one of them being a public spat between two company CTOs yelling at each other on Twitter um, to another one where like, we are doing this, we're proposing a new license, we're going to go through the OSI and see how they feel about it and whether or not this license should be considered as open source. Like that one was much better received because they were doing it community forward or like open source definition forward versus like, we're just going to use this thing that favors us. And so like those, while they were the same license that they picked, the landing was incredibly different because of just how people reacted and how people went about it. So that's not only something you can measure outside of like, just literally following the social characteristics around it. Um, and I think in terms of like long-term success of whether or not these license changed versions versus whatever fork the community gravitates to are more or less successful. I feel like my latest hypothesis is that it's based in feelings, like whose feelings were hurt here and what was done about that. Like, I don't know. And that's not really something that's like very measurable, but seems to have, a significant impact on the direction of both the fork and the original versions. So how do we measure feeling? Yeah, I like bringing in the qualitative aspects of it. Um, I, I really like this conversation in that like we're, um, we're thinking through like the events that are occurring. So like I, last week we talked about takeoff and what, how, what affects that and then now, um, what are potential um, versions and releases that could um, create that kind of time bound um, time frame for 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 looking at um, the data, and then this possibly this then what makes it dead or what what milestone actually makes a project drop, um, and I wonder if we can pull in um, various chaos metrics to then to then look at each event um, event type. The other thing that I think would be really interesting is for somebody to put together a model, like something predictive model, like what is, what is the percent chance that this, uh, or, you know, how likely is this to have a license change based on um, some of the parameters from some of the other projects. And it's, it's such a rare event that I'm not sure that we could really, really model that. But it would be, it would be really interesting, I think, to look at it.
I was just going to speak, but I should be raising my hand. Um, we have thought about it. I think we actually, Sean and I were talking about this in our RIP risk working group, <laughs> um, because it was something that we were, were thinking about as sort of like existential risk. Um, yeah. but also, could we predict this? And a lot of it came down to like, in those sort of very single vendor dominated projects, how much information do we have about the financials of the vendor? Because I think that my, like my hypothesis is that's the biggest indicator, but unless they're, they've gone through a public IPO, then a lot of that information isn't public. So we don't really know, and we can only look for like lagging signals of whether or not they're either running out of VC funding or their company isn't profitable enough. And in some cases, like, I don't know, we worked just goes out of business. Like, it, huh. in cases where they didn't they didn't change the license they just said we're but i don't know if they could like i don't know how many like in terms of like whether or not the company goes up or the license changes not that those are the only two outcomes um but i don't know that is sort of that was sort of the big unknown that i think might have a huge impact on something like this mm -hmm. yeah it seems super hard which is probably why nobody's done it <laughs> it would be it would be interesting it's yeah. it's super hard but i also think it's i think the behavior we're describing where if it's not osi compliant many people if not most in open source run from it i mean I, I, it's a pretty robust signal in my experience yeah but i'm talking about predicting that how would you predict oh predict it's, that they're going to do that yes yeah i it, it's such a it's such a rare event compared to the number of open source projects that you get into that like a, just methodologically, I think it gets difficult. Yeah, I mean, my heuristic, which I mentioned in Slack is if it's not, if the project is not part of a foundation and it seems largely led by one company that isn't public yet, I, I suppose my, that here, it's heuristic though, but my suspicion is higher in that scenario. The elephant factor is very high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or low, right? Oh, sorry, you're right. I've, it's golf. Elf in fact, is like golf. Lower is better. You're right. Or lower right. is worse. No, it's not like golf. Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. It's the opposite. It's not of like golf. golf. It's the opposite of golf. But yeah. yes. So never mind. It's every sport except golf. Yes. Okay, Chan. Did you get what you needed out of this conversation? Yeah, just to have an interesting conversation. Cool. Yeah, thanks for bringing yeah, that up. Yeah, Sophia brings up a good point in chat. I was thinking about this earlier too. It's not a license change, but uh, the linker D move has kind of similar similar outcomes, and that's something we're dealing with right now in the CNCF. Mm -hmm. um, well, I have to I have to drop, but um, this was a great conversation, and I'll follow up with you all on um, other items that you all talked about. Thanks, awesome. Jan. Bye. Okay, project package identifiers. Who put this one on the agenda? That's me, and it's really short. Yeah. Because it's basically just a question of how other folks have approaches in their own analysis and reporting challenges. Um, if you are pulling data from multiple different sources, and it's all about one product or package, um, I've been looking at the Git source, as well as like the package managers have ESIs, but I didn't know if there's any other other either specific identifier way to label that allows you to automate the collection across from multiple sources. Sean. Uh, I looked at, we've looked at this over the years many different times, and it's always the case that not every, every product, every library is different. Some have one library that are like 50 versions of it for different platforms and one repository and the flagging of release and branch schemes seems to fluctuate a lot. So sometimes it's super hard to get at. If I look at just the package manager, I can usually almost always get the the version that's currently used. But that I don't think that's necessarily what you're looking for. You're looking for in more in depth knowledge of each package, right? Like to know where it's get well, up. I'm, I'm yeah, I'm trying to find a consistent <clears throat> identifier that I could say go explore what's happening on GitHub as well as what's like statistics around the package from the package manager. So like right now I haven't found a consistent source unless the specific record internally has both listed of like, here's the ESI number for the NPM registry and here's the 
GitHub repo URL, but most of the time it's one or the other or neither in some cases. So like, it's just more mm -hmm. that I've seen a lot of inconsistent labeling of source and identifier around it. And in this case, like I'd like to apply one and just yeah. say this is the way that I know I can, like, is there, is there one that'll help me find what is happening with this particular Python library from both say the, uh, the package repository as well as like connecting it to the Python repository and online activity, which they have their own platform, not even on GitHub, so. Yeah, it's fair. Gary, you've got I, your hand up. Yeah, I think uh, this is, in my experience, has been just an, a, a trial of how much data do you want and how consistently do you want it? Because we struggle with the same thing of like, uh, our software scanning systems produce a name for a package and sometimes some ancillary information about a package and having like a big glob of it that usually comes from a scanning tool like that has been helpful for us to identify more packages because you can use like these ones match just directly by the name that we get. These ones match just directly by the Maven or NPM identifier that we get. These ones have the GitHub URL. So that's really helpful. Um, so like, in short, as much data as you can get from wherever you're getting it has been my role of being able to identify packages because nobody has a standardized way to identify packages. And like the four, I think, core components that I look for is like some library name of some kind, because then at least a human being can probably figure out what it is the version that that library has, because then at least a human being can check that the version exists for the thing that they think happened. Um, the URL that they claim to be the source code, if the source code is available, and then the system that that, um, that package belongs to, uh, because then if you know that it's like a Maven package and, or you know that it's an NPM package, there's normally some indicators that you can draw on that. Uh, we've done extra ones like periodically the path that that file was installed on the system that we pulled it from has been helpful because they'll usually have some kind of folder scheme of like this dependency is all the way down here and the last two directories are very indicative of exactly <clears throat> what dependency it is because it almost always matches the upstream, you know, like uh, so... There's just a lot that you can gather that I think using a scanning tool has been my surefire way to get at least close to what the package is, as opposed to depending on people to put it in, um, because almost always people will either write NA when you need something or whatever. Um, and like building the thing yourself is almost always the right way to check whether or not you're getting the right package. So, hey, Sean, question. can you mute? We're getting a bunch of background noise from here. Oh. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I appreciate that, Gary, because I feel like it speaks to the pain of, do I need to just do this myself? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think I'm subject to exactly what you're talking about, which is inconsistent human input. <laughs> yep. So thank I... you. Sorry. I, this is like, a, I have a problem right now, and I appreciate this group for having opinions and also wading through similar problems. Absolutely. We, I've, I've also been in the fortunate position to do this twice. We did this at Wayfair, where we had to try to get everything without a scanning system. And that was so much more of a nightmare than just limiting to what is in the scanning systems and say, if you're not scanning it, I'm not telling you what it is, because you need to be scanning your code, scan your code. Yet another data cleaning exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else on, on that one? Okay, auger slash GitHub archive. All right. Uh, this was like a little side tangent that came up in our just previous discussion. Um, is there any reason why we aren't reading data from the GitHub archive? Because I mused on the idea of like, wouldn't it be nice if I just had so much time and I could just have Augur read from the GitHub archive? Wouldn't that be swell? Sophia, I go can... for it. Sophia's got her hand up. Because <laughs> it's, it's missing so much data. 
I okay. want to fix it, Gary. <laughs> it's, it used to be good. It's my favorite historical trending tool. But for current state data, we are estimating 70% data loss right now. Um, no, sorry, 70% of data is in there. So like 20 to 30% data loss. Um, that's the estimate. We haven't actually vetted it yet. Um, it is on my extended list of big lofty goals that I'd like to accomplish this year. Um, but I thought the OSS Insights website did a good job of explaining all the holes in archive. <laughs> Something that people talk about. Right? Um, no, ossinsights.io. I'm going to paste that in the chat. Okay. Um, started their tool based on archive and then quickly found that it was in fact missing things. <laughs> so they basically used archive as sort of their like anchor historical input to basically have a crap ton of data off the bat and then have been supplementing it with the API. At least that was the last time I read their documentation. And that's because it uses the event API and GitHub is including fewer and fewer things in the event API? Is that or is that wrong? It's that archive itself is dropping more events. It's not scaling with the growth of GitHub. Oh, so oh, no. as GitHub has been growing massively, we are just not collecting all events. When the project was initially instantiated in 2011, we worked with GitHub directly to have a master key to remove the rate limiting. And it seems like either that key isn't working anymore and we're being subject to rate limiting or the way that the pipeline was set up, it is just dropping things from the queue because it's too large. So it's either one of those things we, again, like this is, that's why I put dumpster diving in my, my feelings about my current role. Um, we're gonna go try to figure out why it's breaking, um, at least we'd like to, and then work with GitHub to either create a better tool or a better data set. Because ideally I would love a world where we aren't continually cloning GitHub and have however many versions of GitHub data floating around because it's all the same data and we can all just point to the same source. So why not have a better source? Go ahead, John. I'll get up, I'll get up my soapbox. No, I just agree with everything Sophia said. I, I haven't used it in a while, but it wasn't reliable enough and it was had had holes from the start and it just wasn't good enough for what our goals were. And that's why Augur came into being is there was just nothing else that did what I needed to do for research purposes to, so I could speak to the uh, provenance of the data in a paper or on a metrics dashboard. Yeah, and I was talking to Bob Killen recently and, and he was saying that um, some of the new features in, in GitHub just aren't even being implemented in, say, the REST API. They're just being added to the um, GraphQL API. So I think there's also, um, yeah, also some, some thinking that needs to happen around, around that, just like for holes in the data, depending on which API you're using. Okay. Very helpful. And OSS Insight, I guess, same problem, or we just haven't had time to think about it. So, so the link that I shared is another reporting tool that started with archive and then it has been adding your data directly from the API to improve the quality and current okay. accuracy of the reporting. So I, I just shared it because they, they kind of explain where all the holes were in archive and that they, they needed need to supplement it themselves um, in order to make a better tool. Got it. Anything else on, on that topic? Okay, version specific stuff. Anything yep. else you want to talk about on that? Go ahead, Gary. Uh, we cut this conversation a little short. I think um, something I wanted to circle back to is like, I do want to bring this up as a broader topic when I'm ready and when I have a little more time to like formalize my thoughts and feelings about it. Uh, but one thing that Sophia had brought up that I think would be super helpful that isn't necessarily version specific is um, release windows, like how many release windows exist for a project. 
because you can get that relatively easily by getting every single release tag and then how long the project has been alive and then estimating how long the window is. And that's just a metric that like would be helpful to understand how fast a project moves when you want to adopt it. So if you don't think that your team can accommodate daily updates, uh, then maybe don't use this project that updates daily and makes releases daily. And then being able to modulate that for projects that, I don't know, different ecosystems have different ratings of how important that is or how common that is. Um, I think like then you can get into being behind by major releases, being behind by minor releases, and how much risk does that is associated with that. There's just like a lot there that I think could contribute up to chaos in some meaningful way, but it almost feels like it would need to be in a different tool um, than what currently exists. So I guess that that was kind of the can of worms that I wanted to open is like, would that basically have to be a different tool or am I just not knowledgeable about how these tools work? Yeah, that's a really good question. And the the release stuff, um, yeah, I, I mean it it depends a lot. So like the things the, the things that are released on on GitHub, that's easy, right? Because you can just pull the the release info from from GitHub. But there's there's lots of stuff that doesn't release on GitHub. And where would you get that data? And so the release info I think becomes problematic in some of the tools because it's it's easy for CNCF, right? Because we can basically be a little bit prescriptive about how you define releases. Um, and make it easier for us to gather that data in dev stats. Um, but I think when you're looking broadly, like the chaos tools, you could, you know, I don't know. I think it's I think it's wide open. So it, it becomes a it becomes a harder problem to solve and one that you can't really solve the same way for for everything. Um, but but I do really like, I mean, I mean, so you're talking about releases kind of from from one standpoint, but I also like having the release data on some of the graphs because it's it's interesting to see like you know responsiveness for example um what happens to responsiveness when you're you know building up to building up to a release or right after a release when people are tired and don't want to don't want to respond to things it's it's really interesting to look at that data for projects i don't know sean as, as somebody who uh maintains one of our tools what are your what are your thoughts on releases and metrics uh i put some stuff in chat uh, a little bit earlier um if the release data is maintained that i find releases to be kind of a natural boundary in the development of software mm -hmm. and a pretty useful way to frame metrics more useful than perhaps uh just let's look at september or let's look at the last three months because there's a certain randomness in that where if you look between releases, when a project uses platform releases, which they don't all do, then you have a, you know, you can look at a major release as a, as a certain window. Uh, somebody else made the point that there are idiosyncratic ways that projects signal major and minor releases. Kubernetes seems very systematic. Not every project is that systematic. So it isn't perfect, but I think it does represent a useful, perhaps the most useful time boundary um, when releases are used well on a project. Yeah, just as a, an example illustration. So this is this is what DevStats does, as you can see the the releases are these red lines, these red dotted lines, which are got to be super hard to read for anybody who's colorblind with the red on blue. But I don't make the color decisions for DevStats. Um, but this is this is how uh, this is how DevStats displays it. So it is it is kind of interesting that you can see the exact exact release and um, details about it, including all the all the minor releases. So I do find that interesting. Yeah. Something I'll have to noodle on as I get more ready to try to shove another pillar into this bloated idea of viability. It might just be its own thing because I yeah. think ob obsolescence as an idea kind of lives by itself. Um, yeah. And it's, and it's interesting too, because a lot of the charts, um, you can actually filter the data by, by release. Um, right. 
which is which is really uh really helpful so like like you can last decade or between an individual right individual release so that's it's just kind of interesting to be able to to do some of that analysis that dev stats isn't built with like a, a tool that's open source is it it is dev stats itself is an open source project um, however, it is not designed to be used by anyone but the CNCF. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, uh, basically because of Kubernetes and some other very, very large open source projects, they basically, I think they use like the, the fire hose and they just get all of the data on GitHub and throw away anything that's not CNCF, right. um, and which, uh, is the only way they can make this work for the scale of some of these projects. It's um it's it's not a way that that works for anybody else. Yeah, I'm also seeing they they supplement with GitHub Archive. That's helpful to know. I'm yeah. I'm not interested in recreating the effort to build these kind of things. That's you know. Yeah. I'd yeah. Because I was I was just having a discussion actually with uh Josh Burkus, who's one of the people who's involved in in DevStats, and he's like, yeah, we we just don't want anyone else to use this. But it is open source. You can you can use it. You can contribute to it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have four more minutes. Are there any other any other topics? Anything else we want to talk about? Okay. All right. Well. Thank you, everybody. I feel like we had some really interesting conversations today. So thank you so much for, for your participation. And uh, we'll see you in Slack. And then we'll see you in another two weeks. Bye. Bye.